Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan and today I'd like to talk about Elgar's Enigma Variations. And I'd like to go through this famous work exploring how this music is put together. I do believe that having some understanding of form in classical music can greatly aid our appreciation and enjoyment of it. Now, Elgar composed this uh, between 1898 and 1899 and when it was performed in June of 1899 for the first time it was a resounding success and it truly put Elgar amongst the foremost composers of his generation, particularly in Great Britain. Um, it's a piece that really made his name. Now, it's an astonishingly original work, um, a set of variations. Okay, nothing new about that, I suppose. But each variation is a portrait, a musical portrait of uh, a friend of Elgar's. So there's that, there's that personal touch to this music. But you don't need to know the stories of uh, Elgar's friends necessarily to really enjoy this music. As a piece of abstract art, uh, if you like, it's entirely successful. Now, the enigma of the title apparently uh, refers to something Elgar alluded to where the the theme of the Enigma Variations, which we hear right at the beginning of the work, is actually um, a counter subject to another theme which is never, never heard in the piece. Uh, so that's always been a mystery. What is this theme? Uh, probably a very well-known tune. People have suggested, is it Old Lang Syne, Royal Britannia, uh, the slow movement to Beethoven's Pathetique Piano Sonata? There's various solutions have been put forward, but no one really knows. And to be honest, it's not a deal breaker in enjoying this piece. I guess it's one of those things which uh, meant a lot to Elgar possibly. And maybe he had a lot of fun thinking about how it would fox people uh, for generations to come. But uh, anyway, we don't need to know the enigma to enjoy this marvellous piece. Now, if we go to the beginning of this work, we hear the theme, which represents Edward Elgar himself. And it's this very fragile, beautiful melody we hear at the beginning in G minor. So the theme has this A, B, A ternary structure. Um, G minor for the A and a reprise of the A, and in the middle this major section, which offers some hope. Throughout the rest of the, uh, throughout the variations you will hear those motifs, uh, the A and the B, brought back in many different guises. The melody, uh, fits with Edward Elgar's name. Um, Edward Elgar. Da, 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 da. So it's a kind of a, a literal speaking of his name in this music as well, which is rather affecting. After a couple of bars transition, we go into the first variation, which is a musical portrait of Alice Elgar's wife, such a pillar of support whilst Elgar was trying to make a name for himself as a composer. And uh, again, like the theme, it's in ternary form. Extremely beautiful the way um, the strings create this mist around the theme. Uh, incredibly romantic. And 
the bit which always uh, takes me by surprise, I think, uh, just there's this emotion that suddenly wells up out of nowhere that, that happens quite a lot in Elgar's music. When we have the reprise of the A section, the theme, uh, we suddenly have um, the violins uh, with this, this pang, this cry from the heart. beautiful kind of welling of tears there so uh, it's really marvellous you know particularly when it's conducted well that moment. The second variation is said to paint a picture of Hugh David Stuart Powell a pianist friend of Elgar's I think they played in a piano trio together and uh, apparently he played these uh, figurations in a kind of semi-improvisatory way uh, before rehearsals. This variation actually is a theme and variations in its own right. A theme and variations in a theme and variations. Um, well, a theme and two variations in this case. So we have this rather chromatic idea. And that kind of jumps around the orchestra. We have these uh, gliding wind lines. And then uh, the first variation on this, uh, this uh, funny tune begins. We suddenly hear the theme in the uh, cellos and basses. And so on. And then we have a final variation on those uh, skittering chromatic runs. The third variation is apparently inspired by Richard Baxter Townsend, this uh, eccentric figure uh, who lived in Oxford, um, who was known for his uh, exaggerated mannerisms when he sang. Yeah. Again, it's in ternary form. Many of these variations are in ternary form, like the original theme. But we hear this idea in the oboes. And then um, we have this sliding idea for the B section, which is based on that rising major idea from the theme, da, 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 if you remember that. But this time it's like this. We hear on the uh, clarinets, I think, first. Something like that. Kind of sliding up. Then we have a return to that perky tune. And the B section and the reprise of the A section is repeated. The fourth variation is based on William Meath Baker, who was this country squire, and apparently this uh, rather loud music uh, represents him banging his door, his carriage door. I think this is the shortest variation, about a minute long, but again in ternary form if you look at it carefully. This is the main idea based on the theme. And then we have the B section. And so on. A repeat to that uh, boisterous opening, uh, which brings us to a triple fortissimo close. The fifth variation is uh, inspired by Richard Arnold, the son of the poet Matthew Arnold who apparently was a, a fine pianist. This is rather more romantic in tone, uh, rather more sombre as well. We're now in a C minor. Have the B section. It's rather chirpy woodwind ideas. And then we're back to the romantic uh, mood of the opening, the A. We have a repeat of B again in a slightly varied form before a gentle 
coda. Variation 6 is called Isabel, based on a violist El Garnier. A full of these expressive viola solos with wide intervals. Again, it's in ternary form with a coda. And we hear snatches of the theme in the uh, bassoons. Um, and so on. B section just four bars of the da 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 based on that before we return to the viola solos again and then a uh, coda. Variation 7 is called Troit who, who was the uh, I think the middle name of this architect El Garnu who had a rather fiery temper. The timpani uh, begins in this thrilling way uh, in the A section and then we have the uh, The B section moves to the minor. And the heavy brass and the low strings, we hear this. So on. Then we have a return of A again in a slightly varied form, return of B before we have uh, a coda. And by the way, you can follow the form exactly of each of the theme and variations in the description below with the bar numbers. In the coda of this uh, variation, actually variation seven, Troy, we catch a glimpse of the Nimrod variation um, in the brass fortissimo. Which of course we'll hear in a bit. Variation 8 is based on Winifred Norbury, who's this, this uh, aristocratic lady in a country house. I think she lived there with, with her sister. And uh, this has got a rather uh, quaint feel to it, this variation. Again, in ternary form, we hear uh, this first. The B section, we have these uh, rather lovely trills. And then we go back to that first charming uh, lilting idea. Then at the end of that variation on a G, a taka, we segue in quite magically to a common tone modulation from G major to E flat major into Nimrod. Nimrod, one of the most famous English pieces of classical music ever written. Uh, incredibly beautiful, certainly the most famous piece out of the Enigma Variations. And it's uh, a musical portrait of A.J. Yeager, uh, Elgar's publisher, but also his great friend, and like Elgar's wife Alice, a source of great encouragement and support, particularly during uh, the times Elgar thought he, he wasn't really going anywhere uh, in terms of his musical career. And it's said that the theme is inspired by uh, the second movement of Beethoven's Pathetic Piano Sonata. But ever, whatever its source of inspiration, it's uh, a really touching portrait of a great friend. Uh, the theme, of course, is very famous.
wonderful drawn out theme. So moving. It begins with three Ps. We then hear a restatement of the theme. We hear a brief B section, a central section. Then eventually that takes us to the, the climax of this beautiful variation, back to that noble Nimrod theme. Uh, and listen out for the first violins which cut across the beat, adds a bit of life uh, and vitality into this uh, beautiful music. And we have this uh, stirring uh, coda from fortissimo, crescendo and then down dies away to pianissimo and beyond. Variation 10 is Dora Bella, a friend of Elgar's who apparently had a slight stammer, which uh, maybe accounts for the quirkiness of the, the tune. This variation is actually slightly more involved than many of them in terms of its structure. I guess it's more of a rondo than a ternary form movement. The, a, the recurring A section goes like this. There's this dialogue between strings and woodwinds. kind of thing. We have a contrasting B section uh, where we have this uh, solo, the solo viola comes back. Um, we have a return to A, then we have this new section, the C section, which reminds me of Tchaikovsky. Sounds like um, one of the passages from uh, the middle movements of Tchaikovsky symphonies. This more impassioned episode, which I call C, eventually uh, goes back to A. We hear C again briefly before we have a delicate coda. Variation 11 ostensibly is about George Sinclair, the organist at Hereford Cathedral, but apparently on a walk once with uh, George Sinclair, George Sinclair's dog jumped into a river, paddled upstream and jumped out again with a triumphant bark, and uh, apparently George Sinclair said to Elgar, set that to music. And that's what Elgar's done here. This is about George Sinclair's dog. Isn't that wonderful? And it, you know, you can imagine this kind of retriever, whoever it is, uh, you know, tearing away on a stick or something, rushing along uh, as dogs do down a field into a, a muddy ditch or indeed the river Wye. So we hear this uh, in the bass. And we hear these flying semi-quavers all over the place where the and we hear the, that kind of rising theme from the B section of the theme da, 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 you know so exciting we hear a brief, brief snatch of Nimrod as well in this variation and uh, we have a B section which is kind of quite developmental of what we heard so far before a true recap of the A section um, a thrilling variation and a very funny one actually. Variation 12, again uh, another ternary form variation, is, uh, is a portrait of Basil Nevinson who played in a piano trio. He played the cello with, with Edward Elgar and Hugh David Stuart Powell. And this has got these beautiful cello solos in, a very beautiful and moving variation um, based on those wide ranging uh, intervals of the theme. We have a transition on the solo cello before we go into the 13th and penultimate variation. This one's anonymous. Um, it's entitled Romancer. Um, there's three asterisks instead of the person's name. It's possibly um, inspired by Lady Mary Ligon, who 
It's one of Elgar's first loves. But this is a really wonderful variation. The way it's scored is so romantic. Um, again in ternary form. But there certainly is something of the sea about this music. We begin with this. But then in the B section, there's this real kind of tone painting, I think, of um, being at a ship on sea, I think. We hear uh, these very soft uh, movements in, uh, which perhaps suggest waves in the violas. It's very um, almost inaudible to begin with. And then the clarinet quotes the Mendelssohn overture, Calm Sea and Prosperous Voyage. And uh, in the clarinets we hear this. Um, very evocative music and extremely beautiful. Uh, we then go back to the A section and we have this coda where we have that quote from Calm Sea and the Prosperous Voyage again. And that brings us on to the finale and this is Edward Elgar himself again. Uh, he rounds off this whole piece, as he should do, this masterpiece which has put him on uh, the national, if not international stage. And it's rather like a march. We begin with this A section, which is perhaps reminiscent of the beginning of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony as well, with these fifths. And then eventually that gives way to a theme, Largamente, that is the music's held back. melody. That makes up the bulk of the A section. Um, we hear Nimrod as well in this opening section uh, and then we hear this B section which is based on the this uh, rhythm. And at the end of that B section we hear Nimrod again and that's no coincidence August Jaeger, remember from the Nimrod Variations, the source of great support and uh, an encouragement for Elgar. He's with Elgar triumphantly at the end of this uh, masterpiece. We go back to the March theme from the A section and then we go into a new section, quite wonderfully and beautifully and magically, Alice comes back, Elgar's wife, with that beautifully haunting uh, first variation we heard right at the beginning of the piece. Such a beautiful um, moment in the whole work. We go to the B section with that, that rhythm. And that final B section takes us to this amazingly exciting triumphant coda. Nimrod comes back again. The organ comes in as well to really uh, beef things up. The music ends in a, a fortissimo blaze of glory. So Elgar's Enigma Variation, such a wonderful piece, uh, such a life-affirming piece, full of humanity and warmth and joy, and uh, such an inspiring listen. Thank you for watching. Please click like and subscribe if this is your kind of thing. If, if, if you have any suggestions for any other pieces you'd like me to look at, please put them in the comments below. Thank you. Bye.